Thank you, Noah, for reading uh, the beginning part of Psalm 9. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you this morning. Um, my task is a daunting one. Um, you are doing a summer series in the Psalms, and as Pastor Jamie said, um, I, I teach the course in the Psalms at Heritage, and a number of students have taken that course. In fact, I think I taught, I know I, know I taught a course on the Psalms here uh, in one of your uh, lay uh, adult learning uh, situations. And, um, and Jamie, uh, Pastor Jamie asked me to come and speak on a particular topic, and that particular topic was a particular kind of psalm, psalm that we don't often uh, connect with, and that kind of psalm is lament psalm. Psalms that cry out to God, asking for mercy, asking for grace. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those kinds of psalms. But then Jamie went on, Pastor Jamie went on and said, but I want you to go beyond that and I want you to deal with psalms that we, a particular kind of lament psalm that we call imprecatory psalms. These are psalms of cursing. Psalms that call on God to curse the enemies of God for which I am rather not grateful to Jamie for assigning me this task. This is not something that I would choose as a guest speaker to come into a church and speak on. But since I have been assigned the task, you have to listen to what I have to say. And I am quite uncomfortable, but at the same time, I am greatly privileged to open the word of God uh, in front of you. And so the church has always lived in times when bad things are happening in the world. We can't go through a day without hearing the disaster, the horror that is happening in Ukraine right now. And we could multiply examples endlessly. So how do we respond as a church? What is our voice of worship and prayer? in light of some of these terrible things that we're seeing in the world today. We have read some verses, Noah read some verses from Psalm 9, and we heard about the justice and the judgment and the mercy and the kingship of God and how he judges the nations righteously. But what we need to understand uh, while we read Psalm 10, Psalm 9, it actually flows into Psalm 10. And Psalms 9 and 10 are in fact one psalm. We know that because Psalm 10 does not have a title, which most of the psalms in the front end of the book of Psalms do. And then secondly, Psalm 9 and 10 are what we call an acrostic. It's a flowing use of the Hebrew alphabet moving from one psalm into the other. And so at one point or another, these two psalms were considered as one. We don't know why they got separated in our, in our canon the way it, they have, but originally Psalm 10 was a flow through from Psalm 9. So I'm going to read Psalm 10 to you. I think it's going to be on the screen. I'm reading from the 2011 edition of the NIV. But listen to Psalm 10. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, a wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at his enemies. And he says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. 
Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and he never sees. Arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me into account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not be not otherwise be found out the lord is king forever and ever the nations will perish from his land you lord hear the desire of the afflicted you encourage them and you listen to their cry defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror this is the word of the lord I doubt that that has ever been read as an opening doxology in any of your services. But it is Holy Scripture. And it is different even than what I'm going to say because what I say is not Holy Scripture. This is the word of the Lord. And whether we like the feel of it or whether we like the content or whether we like the tone, the reality is... It's in our Bibles. And we have to take it seriously. And as Pastor Jamie said, it's just as God breathed as Romans or Galatians. So I guess I ask myself the question, how does this fit into our understanding of worship? The Apostle Paul told the church to sing and pray the Psalms. He did it twice in two different epistles. And he didn't say, skip some of them. Or skip some parts of some of them. And as I said before, psalms like this, psalms like 5, Psalm 5, Psalm 69, Psalm 109, Psalm 137, 139. They're called imprecatory psalms or cursing psalms. And David is calling, or the author of the psalm is calling on God to curse or judge his enemies as he is a representative of God's people. And they seem to be at odds with Jesus, who said that we are to love our enemies. And C.S. Lewis was abhorred by these psalms, And he wrote this. In some of the Psalms, the spirit of hatred which strikes us in the face is like the heat from a furnace furnace mouth. In others, the same spirit ceases, ceases to be frightful only by becoming to the modern mind almost comic in its naivete. The hatred is there, festering, gloating, undisguised. And we should be wicked if we in any way condoned or approved it, or worse still, used it to justify similar passions in ourselves. Now, as I said before, and by the way, I disagree with C.S. Lewis there. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But this is not a topic I would normally deal with as a guest speaker in in, in a church, but as I said before, I've been assigned this task. Now, this is going to sound a bit more like a lecture than it is a sermon because it is a topic. It's an important topic. It's a topic that anybody who has read any parts of the Bible, and especially the Psalms, is asking questions about and we need to think about and reflect on. And so I hope some of the things that I talk about today will be helpful for you and me as we think about these things. And by the way, I have actually written a chapter in a book on this topic, I have given that chapter, I've sent that chapter to Pastor Jamie, and if you would like a little bit more of some of the things that I've talked about, I will talk about today, uh, you are more than welcome. I've given him permission to distribute that and hand it out to anyone uh, who would ask. 
So first of all, let's just do a quick sketch of Psalm 10. So I, I hope you've got a Bible in front of you or will remember some of the things that, uh, that I read as I read the psalm to you. But in this psalm, we find the psalmist describing wicked people filled with pride, power, and mercilessness and calling on God to do something about it. That's what we find in this psalm. We find the psalmist describing wicked people filled with pride, power, and mercilessness and calling on God to do something about it. Starts with an opening cry in verse 1. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Now, I've often heard people say, we should never ask God why. Well, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we can call on God and ask why. And all you got to do is read Job 3 and see the why, the why, the why, the why, the why. So it is appropriate for God's people to cry out to God and say, why? Why are things happening the way that they are in the world or in our lives? The psalmist then goes on in verses 2 to 11 into this litany of accusations against the enemy. And he talks about their arrogance. He talks about their boastings, their pride, and, uh, and, and, the, and the evidence that they seem to be always prosperous, mouth full of lies and threats, lies and waits. It lies in wait near the, near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. Now, I'll tell you something. If that isn't describing what's happening in Ukraine today, I don't know what is. And we need to have a voice that speaks to the horror of what's going on. Not only among Ukrainians as a population, but our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering. the power and abuse of Mr. Putin. And we need to speak to it. We need to, vote. We, we need to, be, we need to be courageous and call it out and speak to God and use the voice of the Psalms to do so. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. His victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. God covers his face and never sees. Wow. Then there is an appeal for God to act in verses 12 to 15. Arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. This is bold. This is, this is confrontive. This is challenging God to do something. speaks to God and says, you see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief. Calls on God to break the arm of the wicked man and call the evil, evildoer to account for his wickedness. And then he ends the psalm with his affirmation of the kingship of God. And we've sung about that in some of the songs that we sang earlier this, in the service. And the great choices of songs, by the way, this morning. I thought they were fantastic. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them. You listen to their cry. You defend the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere mortals will never strike again in terror. So this is how this psalm goes, and it is rooted in worship. If we go back to Psalm 9, and I said, as I said, Psalms 9 and 10 are actually one psalm. The opening lines of Psalm 9 that, that Noah read were, I, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. So this psalm, all of this is rooted in worship. And the desire and the passion to sing praises to God. But it is raw, it is confrontive, it's even angry. This week I had uh, a, ser a, a service person, uh, a young man, uh, come to our house to do a little bit of work around our house. 
And uh, when he called, we could tell that he was, English was not his first language. And he was very broken English, very thick accent. And um, when he arrived, his first words were, I apologize, my English is really bad. And uh, so we, we, we asked him his name, we got his name. And uh, so I said to him, oh, okay, so what's your, what's your first language? Where, where are you from? And, uh, and he says, I'm from Ukraine. Wow. I'm speaking on that this coming Sunday, or speaking on the, related to this, this coming Sunday. And I, I thought, so that began a very interesting conversation as he did his work around the house. And we peppered him with questions and how he was responding to all of this. And he, he, he talked about the fact that he had fled, fled with his wife and child from Ukraine, went to Finland, then went to Portugal, and wound up in Ontario. Um, and then I said, well, what about your family? Well, he says they are in the Donbass area. Well, if you know anything about what's going on in Ukraine, that is the front line. And he says every day, every night, they wonder if they're going to wake up alive because of the missiles and the rockets that are bombing that area. I said, so what do you think about Mr. Putin and the oligarchs and the army, the armed forces that are attacking his words, first words in his broken English was, he is a murderer. And then he used some language that I can't repeat in church. And it just brought into full reality the horror and the pain of what is happening there. And I say that right now, the church needs to be bold and courageous to speak into this reality. And God in his grace and wisdom has given us a voice. And that voice is found in the Psalms, often texts that we are afraid to read and use. So how do we handle such a psalm? We've seen a sketch of it. I've walked through it briefly. But how do we handle and a lot of ink has been skilled, uh, spilled over this, but more and more people are seeing a place for these psalms in the church. So how do we handle it? Now, I'm going to suggest four basic strategies. And the first one is this. It is a voice of worship for God's people now in the church. I understand what C.S. Lewis was trying to say, but it, he was reflecting a, a spirit that says that the Old Testament and the song, these songs in particular is, are some kind of inferior spirituality. And I just can't go along with that. Jesus himself, the mediator of the new covenant, okay, the new covenant, pronounced imprecations against cities like Capernaum, Chorazim, and Bethsaida. He even called out the scribes and Pharisees and calling them whited sepulchers. Whenever Jesus uses the word woe, it's a form of imprecation. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the New Covenant, and again, the accusation is that this is Old Covenant stuff and not appropriate for the New Covenant. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the New Covenant, wrote this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. The old King James Version says, let him be accursed. And then he said, by the way, this is in Galatians 1. And then he said, in case you didn't get it the first time, let me repeat it. And he repeated it a second time. The apostle Peter quotes a curse from the Psalms to describe the death of Judas. And so these psalms are not limited to Old Testament Israel or are somehow fulfilled and ended in Christ. And if they are, the Apostle Paul and other apostles like Peter, John, and Jude didn't get the memo. I get no sense that these psalms are to be ignored or avoided in Paul's call for the church to sing and pray these psalms. When he said, sing to one another in psalms hymns, and spiritual songs. Second, so the first is they are a voice of worship. Second, they, were all, they are always a call on God 
to act. They are never a personal vendetta. It always has to do with the good of the nation or the people of God. They were regularly spoken by a representative of the people, a leader of the community. And they are rooted in a very critical phrase. And it is this, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, Romans 12. God says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, Deuteronomy 32. There is no sense in these psalms that we take vengeance into our own hands. Yes, we defend ourselves, even as Ukrainians are doing now. But vengeance and justice belong to God. And we speak these psalms as an act of worship in referring all of life, including the horrors of this world, back to God. And that is worship. We acknowledge verse 16 in our psalm, which says, the Lord is king forever and ever. So, it is a voice of worship. They are always a call on God to act. Third, they are rooted in what we know as the Abrahamic covenant. Back in Abraham's day, God said to him, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. He did that for Abraham's descendants, the name of Israel. But we today, according to the Apostle Paul, are the descendants of Abraham. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The Abrahamic promise. I could go to several other passages in Romans and Galatians that say the same kind of thing. The church today inherits the promises and blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. So God's promise to bless those who bless God's people and curse those that curse God's people come down now to us through Abraham, through Israel, to its completion found in the church, the spiritual children of Abraham. So what we're doing by invoking these psalms is simply invoking the Abrahamic covenant, which is now ours. When we call on God to curse the enemies of God's people, we're simply calling on God to keep his promise to Abraham made thousands of years ago. And then fourth, we are called to love our enemies. Yes, this is true. Jesus said in Matthew 5, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. We know that truth well. So how does this fit? It's a conundrum, it seems to be a contradiction. And it's always brought up in this conversation. And here's how I think we handle this. These imprecations are leveled at movements, institutions, and people that lead them that are opposed to the work of God in the church and the world. They are not leveled at individuals as individuals. And I think that's an important distinction. They're leveled at movements and institutions a larger kind of attacks on God's people and the world. For example, I pray that God will take down the porn industry, the child sex abuse industry, movement, institution, whatever you want to call it. I pray that God will take that down. It's horrible, it's horrific, it's terrible. The horrific stuff that is so anti-God and anti-humanity and anti-church and anti-Christian. I pray that God will curse this industry and will bring his wrath and judgment to bear. But if the owner of the local porn shop walked into this building walked into our church this morning, I would reach out my hand and I would say, in Christ, I love you. 
I hate what you represent, and I pray that God takes this whole industry down. And if you go with it, so be it. I love my enemy. I do. But I pray God's curse and judgment in all that he or she represents. I also believe that we need to pronounce imprecation against not just the enemies of the church, but the enemies of humanity. God loves the world. He told us that in John 3, 16. And when there's inhumanity to other humans, God is concerned. God's there. God knows. God responds. All we got to do is go back to the, 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 the very vociferous prophet, God by the name of Amos. And Amos writes this. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus and for four, I will not relent because she threshed Gilead with, with sled, sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Hazael and will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Aven, the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. For three transgressions and for four, for three transgressions and for four, for three transgressions and for four, I will not withhold my wrath. And he says this about, about Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Moab. God is concerned about inhumanity to other human beings as he is about attacks against the church. And so when we see what's happening in, in Ukraine and other places around the world, these texts speak. They speak for us. Crimes against humanity are happening every day. Children, women, men, grandmothers, babies, orphans are being killed, wounded. Refugees are fleeing for their lives and getting bombed while they flee. Cities, ports, hospitals, and homes are mercilessly attacked. All calls for peace and even a ceasefire are falling on deaf ears. A man and his government a movement, an institution drunk with power, wealth, pride, aspirations for empire are invading a sovereign nation and killing exiled people who deserve none of this. So I read Psalm 10. I hear the voice, I use the voice. A voice of worship. A voice of response. I hear and I use a sacred text speak to what's happening in the world today. And I would argue that the church needs to speak. Leaders in the church need to speak. God has given us a voice, a voice in scripture, and we need not to be afraid to use that voice. Eugene Peterson writes, psalm prayer also enters into the way things are, but finds that the way things are are often very bad. Evil is encountered. Wickedness is confronted. This prayer quickens the pulse and shoots the adrenaline into the bloodstream. The people who practice this prayer get excited. They yell and gesture. Prayer is combat. So yes, we hear that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and others, but we call on our leaders to pray for God to act against these movements, these institutions, these power structures, and those that lead them that are anti-God, anti-humanity, and the anti-anything that is good and right in this world. So, just to tidy things up, four final thoughts. They are these. First, what is our encounter with God? What are we learning about God in all of this? What are we learning about our Savior, Jesus Christ? How does he think about this kind of stuff? We learn that God cares about his people, Israel and the church, past, present, and future. We learn that God cares about the poor, the orphan, the widow, the victimized, the one being treated in humane and criminal ways, whether in the church or in the world at large. We learn that God hates injustice and that we can call on him to bring justice. And we learn that while God is a God of love, peace, and compassion, he is also a God of holiness and justice. And we worship him as such. What is the good news here? What's the gospel? The good news is that the first thing I find is we are welcomed into the throne room of God who says you can bring this voice into my presence. 
to come boldly to use these prayers in worship and coming into, into my presence. We're all feeling the pain, the frustration and the anger these days for Ukraine, for the persecuted church, for so many other parts of the world undergoing horrific circumstances. And so often we're wondering what to do with it. Is it worship to speak such a psalm? Is this kind of voice legitimate? Are these psalms for the church? And the answer is yes, and that is good news because it allows us to speak how we feel. It's also good news for the marginalized, the abused, and the victimized. This is the God of Christianity. This is the Jesus of our faith, and we are part of that, and we invite the world to be part of Christ's people and worship Christ as king. But there's one other point that we need to make here. While we pray these psalms, including the psalms that we have just talked about, we may not see God invade now. He is king and sovereign. We've sung about that. The end of the psalm points to that. But he will act according to his will and ways. And ultimately, we know that God will set the world to rights. We may not see it in our day and time. We may not see it in our, in our times of history. But ultimately, God will set the world to rights. Justice will prevail, and the perpetrators of evil will be judged. We hear Isaiah say, God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat, they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for, any, for war anymore. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We hear the apostle John, John's words about the coming new Jerusalem. Now the dwelling of God is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is good news. In the gospel. How should we think differently? What's the challenge here? And I think this shifts our worldview and our perspective of God. We are free to crash the gates with this kind of prayer. We need not blunt our calls for God to ask, act in justice and mercy in our prayer and worship. And this may come as a bit of a surprise to us. Finally, how should we respond? In a recent workshop I did, I suggested five responses. First, read all the Psalms, all of them, all 150, and ask guest speakers to preach on even Psalm 10. <laughs> Please ask somebody else next time. <laughs> and read all of the Psalms. Now, there's a story by that, behind that rooted in this church that I'm not going to tell you, but if you'd like to ask me afterwards, I will tell you. It was, well, okay, now I've already told the secret. One of your, uh, I was speaking on Psalm 139. I'm going to go to that in just a minute. And uh, it was interesting because one of the people came to me afterwards and said, well, we read, read Psalm 139 in church this morning, but we skipped certain verses. I'm going to read those verses later on in a couple seconds here. Read, the, read all the psalms and read all of the psalms. Secondly, teach on the diversity of the voices in the psalms. We have thanksgiving. We have praise. We have trust. Psalm 23 is there. Psalm 46 is there. Psalm 90 is there for sure. But let's read the lament psalm. Psalm 13. Psalm 88. Psalm 109. Read the imprecatory psalms. Psalm 69. Third, Publicly name the horrors of our world and name them, even as I have done. And there are many, many more. Name them in the church. Fourth, become informed and have our leaders pray the full prayers of the prayer book of the New Testament, which is the book of Psalms. And then lastly, 
act in mercy and justice, especially towards those being victimized by evil and evil powers. Nancy DeClassy Walford, who has been part of writing one of the best commentaries on the Psalms, along with a woman by the name of Beth Tanner and a man by the name of Rolf Jacobson, writes this. Is such language permissible in the context of the biblical text? The overwhelming consensus seems to be yes, by all means. People are accused unjustly. Goodness is sometimes rewarded with bad. Justice is not always served. How should the people of God respond? With silence? With indifference? With long-suffering? Yes, sometimes. And yet, at other times, God calls on us to speak out, to protest, and to say, this is not right. Listen to the closing words of one of the most beautiful psalms that I find in the Psalter. Psalm 139 that talks about the, the wonder of the intimacy and the closeness and the nearness of God. Things like, um, you know, how, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to account them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. A beautiful, beautiful psalm talking about the intimacy and care of love of God. And then this. If only, you, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God bless you all. As we close, we've been given the challenge to read all of the Psalms and to engage with God in all the ways that he's revealed himself to us in the Psalms. Just as another encouragement reminder, we do have these um, Psalm, uh, read the Psalms in two months prayer guide. So you can grab one of those on the way out if you don't already have it. If you start on August 1st, uh, you can read it through all the Psalms within two months by the end of September. And uh, that would be a great response to this uh, message this morning. So grab one of these on the way out if you don't already have one. And for our benediction, let me just read from Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. It says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here's our challenge as we go today. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. As we go this week, come before the Lord with whatever's on your heart. He's welcoming you in by Jesus into his throne of grace. Wherever you're feeling, whether you're rejoicing this week, whether you're lamenting, whether you're reading the newspaper and just broken for what's happening in the world, come before the Lord to his throne of grace and find help in the time of need. Amen.